All right, we're now going to finish the book of Daniel by going through chapters 10, 11, and 12. So first and foremost, we call them three chapters, but it is a single vision. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, when this was all written down uh, originally and rolled up in a scroll, the scrolls did not have chapters and verses. Anyway, Daniel's 10, 11, and 12 this single vision expands on the previous visions that were given to Daniel, uh, as well as to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. Uh, it explains um, in verse 14, chapter 11, uh, what is to happen to your people, that being the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, in the latter days. So up to... Uh, and including the day of the Lord. It also builds on the promises uh, that was given in Daniel 77s. Um, that is to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place, that being the temple. Uh, one thing this vision does do, it gives, a, it gives detailed information about the Antichrist, who he is, what motivates him, um, uh, and just how he's going to act. Uh, the Antichrist, one of the most notorious and conspicuous beings in the Bible. Uh, there's actually more recorded in this vision in Daniel uh, about him than anywhere else in the Bible. Okay, so also much of Revelation in chapters 12 and 13 were first revealed in Daniel, and specifically uh, this vision. So we're going to start in Revelation 12 and read part of 12 and part of 13, and then we're going to go back into Daniel, and hopefully it will help connect uh, some of the dots. So I'm going to start in uh, Revelation 12 in verse 7, where it says, Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So this is already is showing a great conflict uh, that is going on in heaven uh, and where Satan is forcibly kicked out of heaven. He is evicted from heaven and thrown down to earth. So let's read on. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So we already see in this loud voice in heaven, this is a milestone, a transition um, in the uh, timeline and history of what's going on with Satan um, and uh, God preparing for the end times. But verse 11, verse 11 points out some very important truths. First and foremost, who is Satan's biggest threat among mankind? Uh, would it be the Jewish people or the Christian saints? Well, it would be the Christian saints because they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. They are the ones that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
Um, and, and so therefore, you know, the question, can the saints win against Satan and the Antichrist? It's absolutely yes, but there's a very big however, and that is in the word and. Yes, we could be ultimately victorious because we have accepted what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. So, and what he has done with his sacrifice has conquered Satan and the power of sin by his own blood. But if we're quiet about it, how effective are we going to be? If we're quiet about it, um, how much of a threat we're going to be to Satan? Um, very possible that those type of people you can just put off in the corner uh, and just not worry about it. It is the word of our testimony on top of what Jesus Christ has done that makes us such a big threat. And on top of that is the next phrase, for they love not their lives, even unto death. So in other words, death cannot be a means of intimidation here. We got to remember, we're just passing through. We're not home yet. And a fact of life is that if Jesus Christ does not come back in our lifetime, we will die in our physical bodies, will die. Uh, and we will move on towards heaven, towards home. So all that to say is that, especially in these last days, there will be martyrdom. There will be martyrdom even unto death. Many saints will be required to take up their cross and to follow Christ. Jesus Christ gave a good summary of this in Matthew 10, verse 34, where he says, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Harsh words. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what is Jesus Christ saying here? I think what he's saying here is exactly what's being said here in Revelation. There may be a time where you will be persecuted, where you will have to face a very important crossroad. Do I disown Christ and take the easy road? That easy road might be, I'm able to travel, I'm able to purchase, um, uh, I will not lose my rights and liberties, or do I stand firm and say I choose to follow God rather than man. And those situations may happen even in our own household. And if we choose to align with the prince of the world, with the antichrist, with the false prophet, uh, with the ways of the world, um, instead of Jesus Christ. Now remember, we're talking about a life or death crossroad. Then, Whoever finds his life in that situation will lose it. And whoever loses his life for the sake of Jesus Christ will find eternal life and special rewards in heaven. So let's move on. Verse 12. 
Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows, he knows that his time is short. See, when Satan is kicked out for good, I mean for good, he knows that starts the clock. He knows that this is now, he is now in the last week of Daniel's 77s. And in his fury, because he's going to be humiliated, all of his bluffing is going to be for naught. And he knows he has absolutely nothing to lose. From that point forward, there is nothing that Satan can do that will stop the clock, that will stop the time from running out on him where he will be thrown into the lake of fire. So this is going to result in an all-out lashing of his fury. Uh, this is what's going to kick off the great tribulation against Israel, against the Jews, against the Christians. Um, this also tells us very clearly there is no pre-tribulation rapture of the church that is found in Scripture. Let's move on. Now we're in chapter 13. Chapter 13 starts, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Um, the sea here would be like the sea of the Gentiles with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, this beast rising out of the sea, to it, which is the Antichrist, the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. So now we're really being introduced um, to the Antichrist um, and with some strong hints of, of where he's going to come from. I mean, stop and think about it. Why is it recorded that this beast was like a leopard. His feet were like a bear, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. There has to be a reason and a purpose. Okay, it doesn't totally explain it, so there's a little bit of speculation here, but it's probably telling us that the Antichrist is going to be somebody with roots coming out of the four earlier kingdoms. Okay. What I saw was like a leopard that would have come from the Grecian uh, conquests of um, uh, Medo-Persia. Um, or it could be one of the successors. Remember, there was four successors after Alexander the Great died, and the strongest out of all of that would have been the Seleucids. Uh, feet like a bear. Well, bear, that was already explained to us in Daniel 7, 5, representative of Medo-Persia. And its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Um, that lion was portrayed in Daniel 7, 4, being the Babylonian kingdom. So uh, to put this all into a, a map perspective, keeping in mind that the lion being the first beast, being the Babylonian Empire. So you can see uh, the extent of that, uh, that was in Daniel 7. Uh, then we got the second great beast, and now we got uh, an empire expanded, especially to the east, towards uh, Turkey and um, Iran, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Now we got the leopard, which is the Grecian Empire, and obviously that added a European component since Alexander the Great came from Greece. But nevertheless, the kingdom, the heart of the kingdom is Babylonian, 
a little bit of Egypt, and off to the east. And then don't forget that the Antichrist, the last kingdom, is all going to be coming out of the fourth kingdom, the kingdom of uh, uh, the great beasts with 10 heads and seven horns. And it's going to be resurrected, as uh, explained in Daniel 2's uh, vision to Nebuchadnezzar, as the kingdom of feet and toes, which will have elements of the fourth kingdom. So all that to say is that the Antichrist will be coming out of the Middle East, probably in an area at or east of the Babylonian Empire of Pass. Okay, enough of speculation, let's move on. Revelations uh, 13 verse 3, one of its heads, now we're talking the beast, seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Now, we're focusing on Daniel this session, so we're not going to get too deep into uh, the, the beasts and the heads and, and the crowns that, uh, in Revelation. That discussion is coming. But the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And I'll put that in today's terms, in, in today's context. The whole earth marveled. That means every time you turn on the TV, it's breaking headline news being repeated over and over and over and over again with with all oh, new new revelations and details. You know, I mean, it could be something as crazy as, well, this new leader, uh, we, we actually got a, a, a picture of what his ring looks like, and, and there seems to be a seal on it. You know, I mean, it's, you know, crazy things like that. But that is probably going to be how the whole earth marvel is played out. Um, as they follow the beast, um, and they worship the dragon. Uh, the dragon is Satan, and the beast is the Antichrist. But then again, the Antichrist is totally possessed by Satan, or we could even say he is Satan incarnate. Uh, keep in mind, rem remember, Satan is a copycatter. And so we had the Lord coming to earth, um, uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, well, that's usually what Jesus Christ does or God does, Satan tries to imitate. Verse four, and they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? I can already see, you know, this breaking headline news, and and you know, the talking heads going back and forth and back and forth. Well, I don't know who is like this beast and who can fight against him. And you, know, and you can already see how the discussions are going to go. Anyway, worship. What does that word mean, especially in the original language? Now, we're talking New Testament Greek because we're in Revelation. So worship here is proskynio, and it can mean divine worship, like worshiping our, our Lord and Savior, our God, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but it's also uh, used in reference, in reverence or homage to somebody that is um, of royalty, of leadership, uh, it could be the kissing of the hand of men, it could be kissing their cheek, uh, it could be using uh, flowing words of, uh, of adoration. Um, I mean, I've, I've had to deal with a lot of, um, of uh, high-level discussions in the Middle East in my career. And it's almost, you know, the protocol is, yes, your excellency. And yes, his excellency would like to see this done. And uh, uh, the, his Excellency will have to, cons you know, consider this. So, I mean, there, this type of a, of reverence or homage uh, to to men of superior rank is very, very common in the Middle East. 
Verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So it was allowed. That means ultimately God allowed the Antichrist to exercise authority for 42 months, for three and a half years, uh, for the second half of Daniel's 77. Verse six, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is those who dwell in heaven. So, this once again is talking about um, his potty mouth, his lack of respect. But it was also allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. And if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain. So all that to say is that Satan, through the Antichrist, is allowed by God to, quote unquote, to make war on the saints, that being the Christians and to conquer them, uh, which is very similar to what we read about in Job. Remember, Job, God gave Satan permission to basically conquer Job, to wipe out his family, to inflict him with painful sores. And as we know, in the end, Job, Job stood strong, he resisted, uh, yes, he had his moments of temptation. And of course, he had his friends that were there to just say, just curse God and die. But he held strong. And what resulted of that was a refined, purified Job. Well, this is going to be something that's very similar uh, to the church, to the saints, and to the Jewish people as well. Um, in First Peter 1.7, it kind of answers why in all this. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So ultimately this, this testing this baptism by the Holy Spirit and by fire that John the Baptist talked about um, of Jesus, the, the ultimate is a pure, refined, holy bride that will give our Lord Jesus Christ the honor, the glory that he deserves. So the saints will face the wrath of Satan Remember, we're talking about the wrath of Satan, not the wrath of God. Okay, and that's a very, very important distinction. Okay, now with that introduction of what is recorded in Revelation, let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 10. All right, verse 1. In the year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. 
Now, first and foremost, uh, the third year of King, uh, King Cyrus, King of Persia, that tells us that A, Babylonia has been conquered. It's no more. It is being um, overtaken and overcome by Persia. And interesting enough, um, the king of Persia still acknowledges value in Daniel. And Daniel is still in a place of, of high rank and high esteem amongst this king. Uh, that also tells us, though, that Daniel is not showing any contempt for these evil rulers. He's giving honor where honor is due. Uh, sometimes honor is due for that person's rank, but not the person himself. Uh, but anyway, uh, we've had this transition in government, and Daniel's an old man now. He's a very old man. I mean, uh, those who have done the math have pretty much summarized that he's in his 80s. And you, we already have then uh, Jewish people that are starting the pilgrimage back to uh, Israel and starting the rebuilding of the wall and the temple. So anyway, uh, first one tells us it was a great conflict. And what he sees and what is revealed is on two fronts, both in the heaven, be a conflict there, and on earth, which we'll see, which will be the, the final conflict. Uh, there will be historical conflicts, and then that's going to transition over into uh, the final conflict with the Antichrist. So anyway, um, verse 5, a man clothed with linen with a belt of fine gold. And so it explains a little bit of, of who this angel is and how Daniel's friends, they couldn't see the angel, but they sensed he was there and they were scared and they run off. And then Daniel's by himself with this angel. And in verse 11, the angel, the angel speaks, O Daniel, men greatly love. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And in verse 12, he says, then he said to me, I have come because of your words. So because of his words, because of his prayers and supplication and, and, and intercessory prayer, uh, this angel has been sent to Daniel to explain what's going to happen in the future. And then he says in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, well, he withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So this is all a very interesting uh, verse here. I mean, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is a celestial being, you know, uh, uh, an angel, a principality, a power. It's hard to say exactly what the label is, but um, he's been assigned to Persia. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, so is he an archangel? Probably so. Uh, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings, plural, of Persia. And we're not talking kings earthly. We're talking kings in the heavenly. Uh, remember what Paul told us in Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms and the conflict they have of, of good and evil in the heavenlies, uh, many times, if not always, determines what's going to happen here on earth. So it's, it's very important, but at the same time, it's not something that we're allowed to see, with very few exceptions, like in the case being revealed to Daniel. Verse 14 and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. 
for the vision is for the days yet to come. This is such an important verse because so many uh, liberal theologians will say, oh, no, 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 this is all historical. And um, because it's historical, it has nothing to do with the, with the end of days. Um, this is kind of the preterist viewpoint. Um, and, uh, you know, what is unspoken in all this? It's a direct attack on Jesus Christ. Because if this was all historical, all fulfilled, let's say by Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, then why was Jesus quoting Daniel? Um, Daniel's irrelevant. Well, if Daniel's irrelevant and Jesus quoted an irrelevant source of great authority, that, that makes Jesus irrelevant. So you can see the the sly and cunning attack. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that these theologians are directly attacking Jesus. Quite often, that's not the case. They genuinely love the Lord, but they're being used to bring a false message. And that's, that's, that's a very for, important distinction. But nevertheless, there is no wiggle room in these words. What is to happen to your people? Your people being the Jewish people. We're not talking the Europeans. We're not talking the Americans. We're not talking the Latinos. We're not talking about the, the Africanos. We're talking about the Jewish people. And we're not talking historically. We're talking in the latter days. And then... It is reiterated, and when, when something is reiterated in Scripture, especially immediately following, pay attention, because this is important. The vision is for the days yet to come. So this is an end-time prophecy concerning Israel. Okay, verse 15 through 19. Uh, it talks a little bit more about this angel. Behold one in the likeness of children of man touched my lips. And then it goes on into verse 20. And verse 20 then, we're starting to see a transition here. So let's read it. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So there's an ongoing battle. I, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. For there is none who contends by my side except uh, against these except Michael, your prince. So, just once again, it's just uh, recapitulating that there's a war in the heavenlies. And guess what? There's demonic principalities and powers that are assigned by Satan to strategic geopolitical areas, in this case, Persia and Greece, and most certainly Israel will be there as well. Uh, and then Michael is also assigned by God uh, to, uh, shall we say, be a shadow over uh, Israel um, and or the Hebrew people, or maybe both. Um, and all this, you know, it should remind us what we just read in Revelation 12, verse 7, where it says, Then a war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So uh, this is nothing more than a climatic battle in what has been an ongoing battle for, for ages. Okay, so that concludes Daniel chapter 10. Um, so I'm going to finish this video and then continue on in Daniel chapter 11 and 12. But let me just say this. Daniel chapter 11 and 12, very, very important, very pivotal, because it outlines that, first of all, it goes into, into uh, shall we say, near future, that being centuries, uh, uh, in the in the near future, uh, that's going to be related to the Persian Empire, which is verse two, and that's going to cover basically a little over two hundred years. And then there's going to be future events related to the Greek Empire, so that being the Alexander the Great and the 
and then probably more importantly, the four generals that arise from Alexander the Great, which we will definitely go into some detail. But anyway, that's going to be almost another 200 years of, of history. And then future events related to the conflict of Egypt and Syria. And this would be uh, the, the kingdoms that came out of uh, Alexander the Great and his, uh, uh, his generals, mainly the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And then in verse 21, we transition into um, what will be the final tribulation for mankind, the great tribulation. So here we're going to pay some very important attention to verses uh, 21 from chapter 11 all the way up until 12, 13. And because this is going to explain the emergence of the little horn, the Antichrist, which we have already explored in, in earlier visions, but this is going to be his emergence before the tribulation, and that's going to be covered in verses 21 through 30 of chapter 11. And then it's going to, we're going to cover his conquest during the tribulation. That will be chapter 11, 31 through 45. And then Israel's deliverance and resurrection after the tribulation, which will be the first three verses in chapter 12. Uh, and then details about the tribulation itself and the uh, transition um, to the coming millennial kingdom. So we will stop here and then pick up in part.